All right. Problem number seven in our march through these 10 of these problems. So here we are. It says a perfectly elastic demand implies that. So before you go anywhere, I'm going to stop. You're going to work on it. But I'm going to suggest to give you a hint. Draw a perfectly elastic demand curve and then answer the problem. So I'll be back in a second. What does it look like? Hopefully you don't need me to show you this, but it's actually the kind of opposite of what we were dealing with, the perfectly inelastic demand curve. We're now going to use a perfectly elastic demand curve, and that's going to really set the other bound for us. So before you even look at the answers or your choices, let's draw a perfectly elastic demand curve. Now, this may seem like an extreme, but actually it's not. We'll, have a, we'll draw a supply curve just to make life interesting here. Here's our quantity, here's our price, and here we are at some equilibrium point. Call that Q0 and P0. Back to the problem. It says, a perfectly elastic demand curve implies that A, buyers will not respond to any change in price. Buyers will not respond. In other words, if the price were to rise for some reason, buyers won't change any of their quantity demanded. Completely the opposite. If the price rises even a little bit, the consumers here are completely out of this market. Is that extreme? Yeah, in some sense. However, what it's saying is that there are so many different suppliers out there who are willing to supply the good at P0 that if one supplier tries to raise the price in order to get more revenue, everyone's just going to flock immediately to the other suppliers and that person will lose everything. In other words, you cannot change the price here because demand is so sensitive to changes in price, it'll completely change if you were to uh, change the price a little bit. So that one is completely wrong. B, any rise in price above that represented by the demand curve will result in a quantity demanded of zero. Any price above this quantity demanded of zero Oh, well, that's actually right. In other words, anything that goes above there, consumers are so sensitive, they're going to buy nothing. So hold on to B, and let me just show you why C and D are. Quantity demanded in price change by the same percent as we move along the demand curve. So as we move along the demand curve, quantity demanded and price change by the same percent. Well, that's not right, right? Because we're saying that if you change price a little bit, quantity demand is going to change infinitely in the mathematical sense, but it's just going to be a drastic change in quantity demanded. So that really can't be the answer. So if you go to D, price will rise by an infinite amount when there's a change in quantity demanded. No, there's, that's really going the opposite way, right? Price is not going to rise by an infinite amount when there's a change in quantity demanded. First of all, change in price is going to drive the change in quantity demanded, so they've got the causality mixed up right here. Anyway, we can just eliminate C and D by themselves, and just I just want to emphasize what this means. A perfectly elastic demand curve, which is going to show up again in chapter 14 on perfect competition, means that the suppliers in this case, or the they face a demand curve which is perfectly elastic. So if one farmer decides to raise their price, they will lose the entire coin demand for their particular product. It's an extremely sensitive situation. All right, that does number seven. We have three more. Let's march on here. And we're going to get to one of my favorite ones, number eight. You're definitely going to see some version of this on the test, number eight, because it's just kind of crucial to this notion of elasticity and total revenue. So they've got a diagram there. So let me draw the diagram before I even read the question to you. And I kind of like seeing you get in the habit of doing the exact same thing, drawing these diagrams, and then you can start to play with them by drawing different parts. They've got a demand curve here, and the demand curve would make look something like this. Right. And we have a P1 and a P2, so we'll call this P1. And we have a P2, and we'll call this P2. And we've drawn two axes down here. We'll make them broken lines as well. And again, just it's important to get into this habit because if you analyze the problems this way, you're much less likely to get into difficulty. Now, I hope I've drawn these kind of D, 
A, C, and D. All right. This may, I may not have drawn this extreme enough, but let's go through it. It says, if rectangle D is larger than rectangle A, then what happens? Rectangle D is larger than rectangle A. This is not your geometry class. This is actually an economics class where we can use this to kind of analyze something. What are they getting after? They're trying to force you to understand what the impact of, or what kind of elasticity can exist when you change price. So let's start here. We know that this is Q1 and this is Q2. So we know that total revenue for under Q1 is something like this. We'll call it Q1. It has this red shaded area here and it has this blue shaded area. These are my new pens. All right, so that's total revenue when price is P1. Why? Because you're selling these many units at this price. So total revenue is P1 times Q1. All right, now the question is what happens when, pri when, when price goes up to P2? Well, when price goes up to P2, we have a different set of areas, and that's, we're going to draw this one with a green, and that's going to be, okay? So now, what are we saying? They're saying that if rectangle D is greater than this, so that says what? That says when price goes from P1 to P2, that this D area was greater than this A area, all right? Which means that the total revenue at P1 has to be greater than total revenue at P2. So I'll write that down. Total revenue 1 greater than total revenue 2 if D is greater than A. Now why is that? Well, the total revenue, again, for T1, TR1, which is P1, Q1, is this area plus this. And the total revenue at TR2, which is P2 times Q2, is this area, which includes B again, and then it adds A. So both revenues, T1 and T2, share the B area. What they, where they differ is obviously is that TR1 has this area and TR, TR2 has this area. And now they're telling you since this area exceeds this, then it must be the case that TR1 exceeds TR2. What are they saying? Demand is elastic between prices P1 and P2. Demand is elastic. So if demand is elastic and you raise price, what happens to total revenue? Again, if elasticity of demand is greater than one and you increase price, what's going to happen to total revenue? Total revenue is going to fall. Why? Because the percent change in Q over the percent change in P, you can see I'm repeating this stuff a lot, is greater than one. That means when you increase price, the whatever relative increase in price you created or, or generated, that the decrease in coin demanded has to exceed that percent change in price, and therefore your total revenue is going to fall. So, nice question, nice answer A. Let's go to B though, because we've got one of these problems that says all the above are correct. It says a decrease in price from P2 to P1 will cause an increase in total revenue. So I decrease price from P2 to P1. Well, when I decrease price from P2 to P1, total revenue A is lost, D is gained. We know D is greater than A. Therefore, again, total revenue 1 has to exceed total revenue 2. So B is also correct. All right. So when you decrease price and demand is elastic, you're going to actually increase revenues. Go to part C. This will seal the deal for D. The magnitude of the percent change in price between P1 and P2 is smaller than the, magni than the magnitude of the corresponding percent change in Q. Go right to your ratio, which I'm begging you to put down all the time, right? It's saying that the percent change in price is less than the percent change in quantity demanded. Correct. That's how you get an elasticity of greater than 1. That's how we got the two changes in revenues when we change price. So that C is also correct. So your answer for number, for number eight here is D. And this is a great problem. So I really recommend you go back to this problem, make sure you understand why each of these choices is correct and why the answer is D, all of the above, and you've been able to kind of analyze it using both the diagram and this kind of ratio. All right, we've got two more to go. Let's take a break.